So we're going to prove this <coughs> exponential shift theorem. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to do an inductive proof. So let's take the easiest polynomial differential operator that actually takes a differential, which is d to the first power. So this is the easiest polynomial operator that actually does something aside from just multiply by a constant. So it's basically the easiest operator I can write down. So we're going to try to see if it's true for this operator. So we're going to do PD. I'm just writing the left side, which is U E to the AX. So we're going to compute this with just a very simple, this very simple polynomial operator. What derivative rule do I need to use here? Remember, U is a function, not a constant. What derivative rule do I need to use here? The product. Product. There's a product happening right there. <laughs> So we're going to write this as u prime e to the ax plus u e to the ax times a from the chain rule. So any questions on the derivative? That should have been pretty straightforward. What can I factor out? e to the ax. E to the AX. So we got u prime plus a u. Now I'm going to do something strange that won't make sense until you look at it in the other order. So think about the last thing I wrote down and then go up. So if I apply this operator, what I get is du plus au, which is u prime plus au. And that's exactly what we got above. So easier to see the other direction than the one that we're using here, which is why I just wrote down that step and then said, oh, it's the same as the step before. So any questions on that step right there? <clears throat> so let's see if it actually follows along with the pattern. So this is supposed to be, uh, now the question is, is this really P of D plus A? So the question is, is P of D plus A equal to D plus A? R function, R operator up here. What do I get if I plug in D plus A? Wouldn't you just put another there? D plus A. It's basically the identity polynomial operator. So if you plug in D plus A to this, you'll just get D plus A. So I basically took the simplest, it would be the identity differential operator is what I used here. All right, so the answer is yes. Yes, factorial. OK. So now what we're going to do is prove it for, so we know, so this was our base case. I'm writing a 1 up there. So we're going to uh, look at dk next. So our base case, it's uh, when PD is D to the first, we got that PD UE to the AX is equal to E to the AX PD plus AU. So that's our base case. That's true when uh, D is just the first power. Now we're going to do our inductive case. 
So we're going to assume true for k. Show this is true for k plus 1. So we're assuming it's true for k. We're supposed to show it's true for the next one. And then using induction, we showed that it's true for 1. And if it's true for k and then would also be true for k plus 1, that takes care of 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way uh, as far as you want to go. So I'm assuming that uh, it's true for PD equals D to the K. <clears throat> so so assume true, which means PD UE to the AX is E A X P D plus A. And now I'm just going to write down the particular P of D and P of D plus A. So the one on the left is super easy, it's DK. The one on the right is a little bit more complicated, but it's just function composition. So it's that input D plus A raised to the K power. So we're just taking uh, D right here and replacing it by d plus a. That's all we're doing. All right, so this is what we're assuming is true. And now we need to prove that it's going to work for k plus 1. As to which side will be more complicated, that's a good question. So we're supposed to show d k plus 1 u e to the a x equals e a x d plus a a plus 1. So I'm going to arbitrarily just say let's work on the left side. So I'm just, they're both pretty complicated. Let's just start on the left side and put the right side in a box. So we're supposed to turn the left side into the right side. Oh, so this is kind of like. Um, we're proving an identity. Yeah. So we're totally. supposing the left side's true. Or, Actually, we don't know what the left side is yet. I want to show that it's equal to the right. All we really know is what's written. Let's see. D. So this is what we know is true. How do I change this power so it's just dk? Take a root of no. Yeah, we're basically just going to factor out a d. So it'll be d times d to the k. And we showed you can factor earlier. So you're allowed to just factor these. They work the same as um, you can uh, do dk plus 1, or you could do dk and then d afterwards. And it'll have the same effect. OK, and we also got associativity, which lets me associate like this. So I'm going to do the k derivatives first, and then the single derivative at the end. What is this inside part right here? All you need is on the board. What is it equal to? How did you know it was equal to this? Um, yep, yeah, because we assumed it was true. So we assumed it worked out for dk. I don't know if it's we're going to work out for dk plus 1 yet, so I left that basically that plus 1 out. So it looks like that extra derivative hanging out. All right, now all we have to do is apply a single derivative and cross our fingers and hope we get what's on the right side. So apply this derivative right now. You got a product rule you have to do. And just to warn you, you got a chain rule with a power right there. So you're going to have a little chain rule going on as well. So apply the product rule and the chain rule in as you go. And you know where, what our destination is.
Oh wait, we don't have a product. <clears throat> There's really nothing to differentiate on the inside of it. Yeah. Hold on. What is going on? Party senses are too <laughs> Yes, there's a disturbance in the force. Oh, I left out the U. That's oh. pretty important. <laughs> I left out that U on the right side. That's why I was having some trouble. All right. So that got left out a while back. Now, let's see. So there should be a U there. Seem true. There should be a U on that second line, and therefore a U down there. Okay. That makes a pretty big difference. So the first part of the product rule should be pretty obvious. Right there. Any questions on the first part of the product rule? Alright, second part of the product rule can be written like... Oh, I totally forgot to multiply by e to the ax. That's pretty important. All right, so any questions on what I wrote down here? So that's basically u prime v plus, oh, sh oh, I cannot use a letter u. All right, how about w prime plus w of v prime? So there's my product rule. This whole thing is v prime. All I did was apply the operator to V. So I just wrote the D operator in front of the V. I haven't taken a derivative yet. But you will. But I will. So any questions on the product rule setup before I I'm gonna actually do some algebra first. Would there be like, U in the first term? Oh yeah, absolutely. So that would be D plus A K U. There we go. So that would be V. All right, first thing I'm going to do is commute the operators. So I'm going to trade the order. So we'll go D plus A to the K, then D, U. So those three big properties we got on the operators, there is commutativity, associativity, and distributivity. Those are the three properties we can use. Pretty much all the regular algebra uh, rules you're used to. So I used uh, the commuting property right there. <coughs> so now is a pretty good time to look at our goal. See what in the world we're supposed to be uh, arriving at. What can I factor out? E to the AX. E to the AX. That's good because our final version has E to the AX up there. So let's factor that out. And we're left with A, D plus A to the K, U plus Now I'm tempted to write u prime. I could definitely write u prime instead of du. So that is u prime. I just don't know if that's a smart move. I'm going to go back for a second and look at how we turned our u prime. There we go. I have a feeling we're going to need to do something very similar to what we did on the base case. So let's think about what we did on the base case right here. We're going to probably have something very similar coming out. So 
I'll write it as u prime. Can anybody see how to rewrite this as a certain operator on u? All right, still may be kind of tricky to see. Let's reorder. What rule did I just use to reorder the A and the derivative? What calculus rule? Distributive. Uh, constant multiple? So it's the, if you think in the calculus way, it's the constant multiple rule. I basically pass the constant multiple through not just one derivative, but a whole lot of derivatives. <laughs> the other rule you could use instead, this is the commutativity of derivative operators, of polynomial operators. Don't celebrate too much. Uh, the A is, is a trivial polynomial operator. It doesn't take any derivatives. It just says multiply by A. So it's a zero degree polynomial operator. So I could either think on the polynomial operator level, which is where some of you were thinking, or I could think in the calculus level. Both better work together and be true. Now we got all those polynomial operator rules off of the calculus rules. So that's where they all came from. All right, in this form, it should be a little easier to see what's going on. What operator is operating on you? So there's, uh, let's see how to write this. So that would just be the d plus a term to the power of a plus an extra one. So, so this line right here, I used uh, the linear uh, property of the differential operator. It, you probably, it's probably easier to see going from the line, the bottom line to the second to last line right there. So if you take d plus a to the k, you basically distribute like this. And then you're up at the second to last line. And from this, this is the exact same step we took originally. This is a plus d of u. So that's a plus d of u. You can reorder terms in a polynomial. You can reorder terms in a polynomial differential operator. So d plus a is a plus d. You can go either way. All right, what is the very last step? It's a pure algebra step. Combine like terms. Combine like terms. So we got term to the k times the term. That's the term to the k plus 1. So this seems like what we wanted to get. Hopefully when I scroll out, it'll be the right side. And it looks like we got it. All right. So that's pretty serious proof right there. I use algebra, calculus, and polynomial operator properties. OK, so now we know for sure that this identity, or the uh, yeah, that inside the box is true. So we just prove that. Things? I will not ask you to prove stuff now. Oh. I'm proving things so that you get a much better understanding as to how they work. Oh, okay. Instead of just giving you formulas and telling you to solve problems, which is another approach I could use. Unless you're going to major in math, you generally won't have to prove any of these things. But usually doing the proofs gives you some extra intuition. It always gives you algebra calculus practice, but a lot of times it gives you some extra intuition you may not have had before. And if you forget about the intuition, you can just derive it. Because you That's know. true. Yep. Uh, you just memorize the intent, you can just actually it. Yeah, if you forget tangent derivative, you can do quotient rule on sine over cosine. Things like that, yeah. So this 
was only proved for a very simple operator, which was d to the k. I didn't show it for, uh, this would be what we call a power function, where you just have the highest power term, no smaller terms. So what about if it's uh, you know, a sum of a bunch of different dk's to different powers? So we're going to look at that now. So the general polynomial operator can I skip writing k equals 0 to n on my sums? So I'm going to omit k equals 0 to n. They're all going to be 0 to n. So I'm going to just skip writing those for the rest of this, uh, this part here. It'll go a lot faster. So let's apply this uh, PD to the uh, UE to the AX. And I'm rewriting it as the summation AK DK UE to the AX. So one of the ways that we can break down this operator is apply the each term individually to this UE to the AX. So I can apply basically the highest order term to that and then add that to the second highest order term applied to that, add that to the third highest term applied to that. It's going to look very unexciting. All that, what I just discussed, is going to look very disappointing when I write this down. It looks like I just changed the order. I did just change the order of the sum and the derivative. So before it was, I should have parenthesized it like that. It was all the terms of the polynomial operator were grouped together. And now what I did, well, it's probably better to write this down, a little bit of detail. So that's the first line there. The second line. So what I did is basically distributed like that. <coughs> Whenever you use summation notation, there's usually a lot more going on than what it actually looks like you're writing. So we distribute it in this way right here. Now, we've already proved what we need here. What is dk of ue to the ax? Look back in your notes. So it's e to the x d plus a to the k u. Right. Okay, so this is what we just proved before. But we only did it for d to the k, not for the sum of all these dk's. And a constant multiple comes down. That's just constant multiple the rule right there. So we have the summation of all these guys. All right, we're supposed to eventually, I should write our goal down, I didn't do that. This is supposed to equal, e to the ax p of d plus a u. So eventually we need to turn it back into that right there. That's a U, not an N. All right, so let's factor out the E to the AX. We can factor that all the way out of the summation. So let's move that outside. What variable does the sum care about? K. It was, it was only written on the very first step, but the sum variable is K. So that's what you better not factor out of that summation. So you can factor A's and X's out. You can't factor K's out. So it would be a 
really bad move to try to factor out d plus a to the k. That you should never factor out. So we got that. I'll write it as summation a k d plus a k u. Let's do the opposite uh, distribution that we did on the first major step. So this will look like changing the order of the sum. So what I did is the equivalent to what we did on the second to the third line. I'm just undistributing right here. No, I actually factored that out as well. Yes, because this has to operate in that direction. So basically du is not ud. Because on the left you have u prime, on the right you have a function times basically ddx. So they the derivative operator is not multiplying, it's operating, even though it's written as multiplication. Does that answer your question? So it's not, I'm not factoring, it, although it looks just like factoring. I, I can only do it because it's a linear, it's a summation of constants times derivative operators, basically. So it looks and feels a lot like factoring. And I think that is P of D plus A right there. If you look, P of D originally is summation AK DK. So if I just replace D by D plus A, I have the bottom line down there. So this is P of D plus A. There we go. That was what we were trying to show. No problem. All right, so that's exponential shift theorem. So I'll write down a corollary, which we will use a, a lot more than the exponential shift theorem. So the exponential shift corollary we're going to use d minus a the n u e to the a x is e to the a x d n of u. Now, <coughs> if you're wondering, well, well, shouldn't we be adding an a? Yes, we should be. If I write out all the detail, the operator is d minus a plus a to the n u. So there is an adding a, a into here. It just cancels out the negative a. So we started with d minus a. You just swap out uh, d minus a for uh, d minus a plus a. So that's just d right there. So this corollary is going to be super useful. And we got one more corollary. So what function is u in this situation? If we want to match this up to what we saw earlier. Somewhere. If I want to match it up to something that looks like like this. What is u? u is c right here. So if I flip that to our here u is constant. What is derivative of a constant? zero. 
so u is a constant. So I'm just reading the original exponential shift theorem. We have e to the ax times p d plus a of c in this case, because c is u. We said all the, the first derivative of c is 0, so all the other derivatives of c are 0. Yeah, we only care about the, the a. Uh, so this will equal p of a times c. This only works because we're operating on a constant. So all the derivatives of the constant are 0. So it really only matters about the non-derivative part of the operator. Do you know what corollary means? Corollary is a trivial application of a theorem. It's not considered significantly different from the original theorem. So it basically is a trivial consequence of, of a theorem. So you could think of it as a baby theorem, I guess. So it's if you have the exponential shift theorem, it's the other corollary was super, super easy to see. You just swap out uh, p of d by d minus a to the n, and then apply the rule. Yep. All right, so that's another corollary right there. Let's go ahead and make some computations. you could find this derivative operator of this function the long way. You could take the second derivative, then, or take the first derivative, multiply it by two, take the second derivative, add it to the doubled first derivative, and then add three of these together. That sounds like a lot of work. Is this in the same form as our original exponential shift theorem? So I'll write the exponential shift theorem over here on the right. What function is u? It is the same form. What function is u? Sin x. u is sine x. All right, so applying exponential shift theorem, uh, I should write down, what is p of d? It would be that, d squared plus 2d plus 3. All right, so there's our polynomial operator. Our function u is sine x. What is a? Super easy question. All right, apply exponential shift theorem. I'll give you a minute head start. You're going to need p of d plus a, which is p of d plus 2. I'll go ahead and compute that for you so you can be a little bit lazy on your algebra.
should get this second line I'm writing on the left. Should be pretty obvious. I just rewrote the exponential shift theorem with our specific values in here. So any question on that first line, e to the 2x, p d plus 2 sine x? Any questions on that right there? So all I have to do, I'm going to swap in. It did take a couple seconds to compute p of d plus 2. That's just regular pre-calculus stuff right there. That's super easy polynomial algebra right there. So any questions on p of d plus 2? That's like middle school stuff right there. So that's no problem. So that's uh, d squared. We got e to the 2x. d squared plus 6d plus 7 sine x. Now you do have to distribute the operator and take these derivatives, but this should be way better than messing around with that product rule you were about to do before. That's not terribly fun. And no product rule going on here. bad at arithmetic. A was 2. Did I write P? Do, did I write the original problem down the exact same before we worry about mistakes? Okay. So it's probably my algebra of P D plus A. Okay, so it's a tiny bit different. Hopefully. In the second black line on the right, instead of 2d, that would be 2 times parentheses d plus 2. Ooh, wow. I didn't do so well in middle school. <laughs> I was way better at exponential shifting operators than, <laughs> than algebra. G plus 2 plus 3. There we go. Plus d squared plus 4d plus 4 plus 2d plus 4 plus 3 plus 6d plus 8, 9, 10, 11. There we go. So again, you could have computed this the long way without using any theorem whatsoever. Just the definition of that, how to apply the operator. But that would have required pretty serious product rule right there. There is another way you could have done this slightly faster. You could factor this. No, no actually this doesn't factor very nicely. I was thinking uh, plus 3 plus 1, but that's not going to factor this that nicely. So I can't go algebra on the operator. Yeah, numbers I don't want to, I'd rather, much rather go this route than try to factor it. So we'll do one more example. Yeah, we'll do one more example. I don't want to do a higher degree than two because it's going to take a really long time to find, if it was a seventh degree and I want to do, you know, d plus four to the seventh power, no, that's not. I'm 100% sure I don't want to do that. Uh, I wouldn't give you higher than degree 2 or 3 on a quiz or midterm. So on this example, I want you to finish this beginning to end. So write down, you got no A, you got no U, and your P of D. So I'll just write down the things you have to find P of D, A, and U. And then of course you need P of D plus A. So those are the four things you really should find first, and then you can apply the exponential shift theorem. And 
There we go. I got everything on the board that you need, basically, including the shift there. I'm in the upper right corner. So let's take two minutes on, three minutes on this. It's a good time for questions. This can be really tricky at the beginning. Hmm? It's not that difficult, but it's very new. Because we're mixing calculus and algebra together. Which is why it's awesome. Make sure you be careful, parenthesize your d minus 2. Make sure you square it carefully, multiply it by negative 1 carefully. So don't do the mistake I did above. Make sure you do. When did you do d minus 1? Uh oh. No? No. What's a? A would be. Uh, nope. A is negative 2. And where does x cubed go? Oh, sorry, I was thinking about you. Where does x cubed fit in? That's the u. And p of d is d squared minus d plus 3. plus a is really d minus 2. So you got to figure out what is d, uh, p of d minus 2. you call it a substitution. <laughs> yeah. And then you just fit d minus 2 in that in those boxes. Obviously they're you need a bigger box. <laughs> yeah. But Although I've seen you write pretty small. <laughs> I can. I've seen my t-shirts before. <laughs> if you get out your special lead size like half a millimeter pencil. <laughs> it is. It literally is half a millimeter. Is it? Yeah. So oh. by I think they have a point three too. Three seven five, yeah. All right. So what I just my pen pal is three seven five. So if you have trouble function composition, just replace d by a box, and all I'm going to do is put d minus two into those boxes. So if you ever have trouble with function composition, just use this box method. It's basically a placeholder. And then d minus two came from. That's that's what I just what we're plugging in. No, no, but so that came <coughs> from um, a. Which yeah, it's d plus a, so it's d plus negative two. Okay. And our motivation for doing this is the exponential shift theorem. That's why we're finding p of d plus a. 
There's a plus three, is it? Yep. Ah. Plus, plus. All right, what other mistake did I make? You forgot to find the fence. So that's another reason the box can be useful because it basically shows you the grouping. All right. Any of you expand this out? Can tell me what it is? Plus nine. All right. Anybody else agree with that? Yes. Good to go. Okay. All right. Sounds like it's time to go. <laughs>